is the start of the 2006 United States Grand Prix. There was chaos, pandemonium, and wanton destruction. All around, there were bruised egos and literal bruised bodies. Being thrown into the sandbox surrounded by bits of what used to be your car ain't the most ideal way to go about starting a race. But then again, these kinds of things just happen, so most people just took it for what it was an incident. But once the dust settled and the drivers started to walk away, no one, and I mean no one, would have believed that this very moment would ultimately lead to arguably the greatest rookie season that F1 had ever seen. Back in these times, the GP2 series served as the last step on the route to Formula 1. Therefore, to win this championship would mean everything. This was the third to last race of the season, and the title battle is still raging. And for the two drivers involved, a lot was on the line. I mean, obviously, apart from this particular championship, their prospective futures as Formula 1 drivers were hanging in the balance. For Nelson Piquet Jr., he might not have been the most talented driver the world had ever seen, but he did have a lot going for him. Regardless, the team was behind him. I mean, it was owned by his father after all. Thus, the machine was behind him. A championship win would help him get to F1, but for now, he didn't have that added pressure of being the leader of the GP2 driver standings, whereas the driver of the number 2 red and white ART Grand Prix car did. He had a bit of a buffer in the points, but not that much. And pretty soon in this race, that lead of his was about to be thrown into turmoil. This spin had dropped him down from 8th place to 18th. This was a disaster. He probably remembered at that moment that if he were to lose that championship, it would have damaged his chances of getting a drive in Formula 1. And with PK in front scoring valuable points, that left this driver with only two options. Break down and cry, like, like I would, or do what he did and charge like hell. Car after car after car. He scythe past all of them, displaying some brilliant racecraft, things you only really ever see of drivers that have the innate driving ability within them. He kept moving up through the pack. He got into the points, past rival PK, up onto the podium, and ended up finishing in second place. Sure, not quite a win, but to go from 18th to second in a drive like that was incredible. It was a performance that is still talked about today, and is one that, for a lot of people, put that driver on the map. His name? Lewis Hamilton. Lewis had been a McLaren Junior driver since 1998 and had tested Formula 1 machinery since 2004. McLaren had a lot of faith in this kid, but even though he would go on to win that GP2 championship that year, McLaren didn't have any immediate vacancies in their F1 driver program. They already had top tier talents Kimi Raikkonen and Juan Pablo Montoya as their drivers for 2006, and for 2007, they had signed the two-time reigning world champion, Fernando Alonso. I know, I know. Three contracted drivers and two seats. The math Math ain't mathin' on that one. Even though Martin Whitmarsh sold hopes and dreams to Lewis about a prospective drive for 2007, there was no guarantee of anything, especially with all them driver contracts. But McLaren decided that whatever the plans were for 2007, Montoya was not going to be a part of them. And then, at the United States Grand Prix, after walking away from this crash, a crash that he caused, a crash that took out both he and his McLaren teammates, he shocked the motor racing world by announcing that he would be leaving the McLaren team and Formula 1 as a whole, effective immediately. This left McLaren in limbo and pissed off team principal Ron Dennis so much that you would think that this was some kind of personal offense toward him. And it probably was. And with Raikkonen announcing his leaving to Ferrari for the next season, McLaren, after initially having three drivers under contract were all of a sudden searching for a new driver come 2007. But who would it be? After Montoya took his ball and went home, McLaren deputized their test driver, Pedro de la Rosa, to drive for the remainder of the year. For sure, Pedro was the greatest driver never to be considered great, but Ron Dennis always had eyes for better drivers. After having Raikkonen and Montoya as his lineup, this, with all due respect, was a step down. They had a long, hard think about what driver they really wanted to run with for 2007. They had all the data, they knew the options they had, and after a sum total of 14 seconds worth of thinking, the call was made in late September for the Hamiltons to meet at Ron Dennis's home. And it was there that he, along with Martin Whitmarsh, let Lewis know the news that for 2007, that second McLaren seat 
was his. For a lot of reasons, this was significant. The last time a rookie made their Formula 1 debut in a top tier team was Jacques Villeneuve at Williams in 1996. And after over 60 years, this marked the first time a black person would race in Formula 1 full time. Something long overdue. For the boy from Stevenage, this seemed an almost impossible dream achieved. Lewis understood the weight of an opportunity like this. He knew that he just couldn't afford to mess something like this up. He had heard tell of drivers of the past waltzing into the paddock, driving the car, then leaving the circuit without even uttering one word to the mechanics. Not even a hello or a goodbye. Just nothing. Lewis didn't want to be this type of dude, but rather, he wanted to follow the footsteps of another driver. He had seen the dedication that the great Michael Schumacher had put in that ultimately made him the god of Formula 1 for decades on end. Lewis supplied himself at the factory in Woking ahead of the 2007 season in anticipation for what was to come. But no matter how much he applied himself, the reality was that Fernando Alonso would be his teammate. The two-time reigning world champion. One of the quickest drivers you would ever see in a Grand Prix car. A ferocious competitor whose heart matched his eyebrows, Lewis was being thrown into the lion's den, even if he felt he was ready for Formula 1. Even if by compared to the rookies of today, he would have a lot more testing and thus be better prepared. It's impossible to know for sure, at least until those five lights go out. And so... There he was. The boy from Stevenage had achieved his dream of becoming a Formula 1 driver. He felt he was ready, but was he ready? He was certainly nervous heading into the weekend. I mean, how could he not be? All the commitments, as well as the aura of the weekend before him, did begin to get to him in the days leading up to the race. But he did vanquish these relatively quickly, apparently. And soon enough, he was back in the space where he needed to be. His first qualifying session saw him place his McLaren fourth on the grid. Not bad, even if Fernando was quite a bit faster. He admitted being a little bit disappointed not to outqualify him, but this was his first weekend. You don't have to get that brass ring right away, bruh. Not too much what's expected other than just staying out of trouble and getting some decent points. But through months of expectations, all the talk, positive or negative, those that saw him as a prodigy, those that thought he wouldn't stand up to the task, once those lights went out, it was only then where the world would see what Lewis was really made of. He got a good start, but the BMW Sauber of Robert Kubica slotted in ahead of him. They all darted to the inside, and Lewis knew that this would box him in and leave him vulnerable. So at that moment, he thought, F*** it. I'm gonna make me some moves here. He went to the outside, trusted in the grip, and when he came out the other side of turn one, he was ahead of Alonso. That was a hell of a statement to kick off your F1 career. He was now behind Nick Heidfeld, but his main objective, apart from not slamming into the wall and dying, was to make sure them eyebrows were a mere speck in the mirrors. Just keep pushing, keep going, don't make too many mistakes. And he didn't, but then he got bulked by Super Aguri's and Spikers, which ultimately threw him behind Alonso. He was a little dejected about losing out to his teammate, but... <laughs> God's sake, man. It's Fernando Alonso, a living legend of not just Formula One, but motor racing as a whole. And hey, dude, in your Formula One debut, you got onto the podium from around 18 months ago, where he briefly lost his McLaren backing as a Formula Three driver. He was now on the F1 podium in his Grand Prix debut as a McLaren driver, standing alongside, if you discount Robber, the two best drivers in Formula One at the time. Then thoughts started rushing through his head of, was this just a one-off? Can I sustain this? Whatever may come though, seeing his father Anthony down below the podium, he knew that he had done his family proud to come this far already after everything that it took. But he also knew that after this, everything was about to change. Malaysia is always one of the more grueling races on the entire calendar. The heat and humidity can lead drivers to lose 10 pounds in a race. And for it to be the second F1 race for a rookie is trial by fire in a big way. Because these were times where in-season testing wasn't rationed like food stamps during a cordyceps outbreak, McLaren did manage to complete some testing at the circuit in the three-week break preceding this Grand Prix. So Lewis did manage to get his iron somewhat. Once again, he had qualified in fourth place, two spots down on Fernando. They were wedged in between the Ferrari but on the run down to turn one, both of them neglected to see behind them to see the red and chrome number two McLaren siding past them. Though it wasn't as if the Ferraris were just gonna let him get away. Both Massa and Raikkonen were on his gearbox for the remainder of the Grand Prix. Massa attempted to move down the inside into turn four. However, in all his excitement, he missed his braking marker and slid off into Brunei. Raikkonen then took heed and began to charge after Lewis. No matter what he tried, however, Lewis remained ahead until the very end. Up at the front, Fernando led all 
all the way to the flag and secured McLaren's first win of the season. It might have been a bit disappointing for Lewis, but he did know it was only a matter of time before he would secure his first Formula One win. The only question was, when? At the third round in Bahrain, Felipe Massa in the Ferrari took pole position. In second was Lewis. He had outqualified Fernando for the first time, and in the race, he would stay ahead of him to keep that second place. His tyres did kind of not work for him in that second stint, although he was getting closer to that win. As soon as the race was run, however, It was off to promotional events all across the world, from Manama to Shanghai to London, off the plane and straight on stage. The trials and tribulations of being a Formula One driver. Oh, however do they cope? Of course, while the task of explaining why Mobile One oil all over Castrol Edge is a task for souls braver than mine, there was something else that Lewis would have to face that challenges the soul more than anything else. Racing in Spain with Fernando Alonso as your teammate. Initially though, the Spaniards were all smiles, given Alonso had qualified in second ahead of his teammate. But on the first lap, he was thrown off into the sandbox after trying to pass Massa around the outside into turn one. This left Lewis free to chase after Massa, but the Brazilian was on fire. Yeah, I know that's lame, but give me that one. And it was he who would take the win that day, with Lewis finishing yet again in second place. That first win was eluding him, but if it was any consolation, when he left Catalonia, he was leading the World Drivers' Championship. And in doing so, he set the record for the youngest driver ever to lead the Formula One World Championship, beating the record set by Bruce McLaren, the founder of the team that Lewis now drives for. Actually, on that note, McLaren really couldn't have been happier, because despite Ferrari arguably having the better car, McLaren had their drivers one and two in the standing and the team as a whole was leading the constructor standings too. They had two highly competitive, highly elite drivers doing the job for them. But the problem with having two drivers like that in the same team is that the marriage never lasts long. That weekend in Monaco, the McLarens once again were dominant. Alonso was on the pole and Lewis was in second. The race was a procession and stupidly dominant. Massa in the Ferrari was the only other driver not to be lapped. And even he was close to befalling that fate as well. Alonso and Hamilton was how it started and that's how they ended. Seemed pretty cut and dry, but behind the scenes, there was a little bit of tension brewing. Well, maybe a bit more than little. Over the course of the race, Alonso was managing his car and keeping it running to the end, trying not to throw away a golden opportunity. He was also on a one-stop strategy, so managing the tires was a factor too. But Lewis, on the two-stop strategy, was being told to keep the gap to him to five seconds. McLaren didn't want to run the risk of having both cars thrown into the wall, but Lewis wanted the win, and he made that clear. After the race was run, it was suggested to Alonso within the team that Hamilton should have won that race, given the pace he had shown. Fernando flew off the handle at that, and by now, he realized that this, this whole team dynamic thing is not gonna get any easier. For the Lord of the Eyebrows, this was the beginning of the end for him at McLaren. At least for this chapter, Lewis, meanwhile, was also pissed. He felt he should have won that race had not for the dastardly orders of the team. Lewis wanted that first win and was getting away all the time. But Ron Dennis pulled him aside and reminded him that there was still a lot of races left in this season to just let a cool head prevail because it was never a matter of whether he could win a race. It was a matter of when. In Canada, Alonso went into the weekend as the championship leader, and he decided to celebrate this by having an absolute stinker. On lap one, he locked up and went off the track. He then got a stop-go penalty for pitting too early, which, to be fair, wasn't really his fault. And then he wound up being passed by Super Aguri's around the outside, barely finishing in the points. It was in stark contrast to his teammate, who, in qualifying, began his journey by securing his first ever Formula One pole position. A stonking lap that was nearly half a second clear of Fernando. On Sunday, he was in pretty steady control of the race, but safety car after safety car after safety car kept the field bunched together. There was the slight tinge of panic of, oh crap, I'm gonna lose this, I'm gonna lose this, I'm gonna lose this. But eventually, as the laps whittled down, the doubt started to go away. He was doing exactly what he needed to do. And then, on lap 70, he was greeted with the chicken flag, and Lewis Hamilton had become a winner in Formula One. For so many reasons, this was an important moment for Lewis. Not just for winning this really nice vase, but because this was a psychological breakthrough for him. Any and all doubt that he had was erased. He had aimed for the top, and he had gotten there. 
Just days later, he had taken his second pole position and won the race again on Sunday and further cemented his lead in the driver's standings. His consistency thus far had been exemplary, not just for a rookie, but for anybody with any amount of experience. His feet had not left the podium ever since he had broken into Formula 1. Things were going pretty well for Lewis and for McLaren. At least that was until the Civil War started to kick off. Over the course of that weekend in the US, Alonso began alluding to the fact that perhaps McLaren was siding with Lewis over himself. And there is nothing easier on this planet than throwing a European racing driver into paranoia. Of course, McLaren denied this, but even if it were true, there might have been more than one reason. Lewis had been a McLaren driver since before the turn of the new millennium, and since joining the team as an F1 driver, made every attempt to gel and work with the team to make the dream happen. With Fernando, it wasn't quite that way. Having long been a Michelin man, a lot was made of Fernando's struggles to get to grips with the new Bridgestone tyres, and also with the struggles with integrating at McLaren. But the main problem he now had was that Lewis was gathering momentum, and Hamilton wasn't really prepared to lie down and just wait for Fernando to get comfortable. I mean, can you blame him? In France, it was the Ferraris that seemed to yield the better package. In fact, the moment that Kimi went on by could have been determined as the starting point for his comeback in the championship. The only consolation for Lewis was that after walking away from the weekend as runner-up, at the next round, he would be home. Ever since Nigel Mansell retired from Formula 1, the attendance figures for the British Grand Prix were just never quite the same as they were before. But in 2007, that all changed. Lewis's success had captured some of the hype that the Brummy Mammoth had achieved back in his heyday. And this was good news for the promoters. They'd be earning enough money now to the point where they could stop pretending to be poor. But you would imagine that with all this added pressure at home, Lewis might have been shaking like a dog shitting peach seeds. The weight of a nation on his shoulders. And to be labelled the British hope by the press is about as much of a curse as getting a dedicated video on this channel. On the other hand, a hometown crowd, as well as the comfort of racing in your backyard, can give a driver those extra couple of tents. Is it ball? Yes, yes! He's done it! Lewis Hamilton sticks out the Goosebumps. Pure goosebumps. This is the sort of stuff that hometown heroes are made of. I know how corny that sounds, but I'm not totally far off the mark now, aren't I? And sure, race day didn't pan out as he would have wanted. He tried dragging his fuel man onto the track and ended up missing out on the W. But he did bring home a solid amount of points with yet another podium finish. We were now at the halfway mark of the season and the pace exhibited from Hamilton had been very good. But it was the consistency that was remarkable. Whether rookie or season pro, this was incredible. It was ultimately what was bolstering him up in the driver's standings and was making him look like a million bucks. But like all good things, it had to end at some point. The European Grand Prix was a complete write-off. He went into the event with the flu, or a virus, or a stubbed toe, or something. So he would have had to have unleashed his inner Michael Jordan to make something of this weekend. But crashing and qualifying, thanks to a wheel gun man falling asleep, wasn't exactly how he envisioned things happening. The madman wanted to get back out on track immediately. But something about damaging muscles and ligaments doesn't make that the best idea in the world. It is actually quite exciting when you're flying, you know, head first into a barrier. The initial part. The initial part is actually c Loaded up on painkillers, he made it onto the grid for the race on Sunday, but on lap two, he spun off at turn one, joining the other 300 drivers stationed in the makeshift parking lot. Some argue that he was unlucky to miss out on a point. Some say he was lucky to be in the race at all. And actually, it was what happened after this that would change the course of the championship. But most would agree regardless that he was driving too fast for the conditions and ended up throwing away valuable points. Alonso would go on to win that race, meaning McLaren was still bagging a lot of points for the Constructors' Championship, a title they were sure to win quite comfortably. However, in the background, there was a lot of noise being made about a potential espionage situation between McLaren and Ferrari. For the time being, McLaren denied culpability and it was more background noise to them rather than an actual issue. And that was kind of a good thing because internally, they had other issues going on. At various points over the last few races, tension had been brewing between the teammates, and Alonso was the most vocal one of the both. It was clear that he was none too pleased about being beaten by a rookie, however frequent, and that he was convinced that the team was siding with the Brit and conspiring against him. It was the type of paranoia akin to John Surtees, who thought that everyone who boarded the same plane as him was a spy, and all of this came to a head in Hungary. 
During qualifying, Lewis disobeyed team orders and didn't allow Alonso past him in the running order. He claimed that this was to avoid being passed by Raikkonen, but whatever his reasons, this put the Lord of the Eyebrows at a disadvantage and into a dark mood. Now, these types of disagreements happen all the time in Formula 1. Senna and Prost, Villeneuve and Peroni, Lance Stroll and Consistency, and each react in their own way. How did Alonso react? Well, toward the end of the final session, McLaren stacked their drivers in the pit lane to allow for space on track for a final lap. Fernando was in front of Lewis, and when McLaren gestured for him to go, he just sat there. With Lewis stuck behind him, everyone knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. And ultimately what this meant was that Lewis wouldn't have enough time to set another lap and Fernando would take pole position. Until the stewards decided to step in, strip him of said pole position and hand him the death penalty. Almost. Initially, Lewis thought that this was Ron Dennis' way of getting him back after ignoring those team orders. But on the contrary, Dennis had thrown his headphones to the ground in a fit of rage. He had already lived through one civil war in his team. Now he was beginning to realize. Oh shit. Here we go again. It was also decided that, for this round, McLaren were to be barred from scoring any constructors points. McLaren would appeal this, only for the FIA to say, hey, What? What's this appeal thing that you talk of? Never heard of that. Lewis went on to win the race on Sunday, but over the next few rounds, he struggled to maintain the consistency that he held over the first half of the season. In Turkey, his front right tire blew coming out of turn eight, something which Bridgestone attributed to overdriving on Lewis's part. Monza wasn't too bad, with Fernando and Lewis getting a one-two for the team, but there was an unwelcome distraction in the espionage debacle that eventually earned the nickname Spygate. While an FIA hearing in July didn't result in any penalty for McLaren, a second hearing a couple weeks later in September did, and the consequences were huge. When the team arrived at Spa-Francorchamps for the Belgian Grand Prix, there were rumors floating around, and a team member relayed to Lewis that the powers that be were attempting to disqualify the team and its drivers and throw them both out of Formula 1. For Lewis, the world came crashing down all at once, to come this far, and for it to be all taken away over something that he had virtually nothing to do with. How can this happen? But ultimately, somewhat thankfully, it was only the team that would be disqualified and were handed a $100 million fine, the biggest of its type in the sport's history. That might have been more of a power trip from Max Mosley, but while Lewis was queried and later cleared of any involvement in this debacle and would keep his points to stay in the title hunt that year, it was the absolute last thing he needed on his mind with only a handful of races to go. This was the third to last race of the season, and the title battle is still raging. For the first time in 30 years, the Japanese Grand Prix was held at Fuji. And while the track had changed significantly in all that time, the weather still remained the same. Cold, damp, miserable. Kind of like England, and exactly the type of conditions that Lewis thrives in. It was Hamilton and Nando on the front row, and by this time, both just wanted bygones to be bygones. They both wanted to race each other hard, but also fair and square, and without any controversy. Aw, I'm touched, really. <laughs> Down the pit lane, Ferrari were in a world of hurt when they attempted to run intermediate tires in a lake. I guess it wouldn't have been Ferrari if they didn't do their utmost to throw away a championship. Up at the front, however, Lewis remained untroubled for the majority of the race, shipping away, going about things, getting the job done. It was driving that, for the time being, was going to help carry him to the title. On lap 41, a McLaren slammed into the barrier. But it wasn't Hamilton. Fernando Alonso was out of the race after struggling with contact damage made in the opening laps. And he had to watch helpless as Lewis went on to claim his fourth win of the season. Now, the significance of this cannot be overstated. There were only two races remaining and a maximum of 20 points up for grabs. Lewis left Japan with a 12-point gap over Alonso and a 17-point gap over Kimi Raikkonen. This effectively gave Lewis one hand on the trophy, heading into the second to last round in Shanghai. Lewis made life easy for himself in qualifying by nabbing yet another pole position. This set himself up well for Sunday, and if everything went well, he would be the Formula 1 world champion in a little under two hours. It would be a nice way to get back at the racist coward f***ing assholes that were heckling him over the course of the weekend, over the course of the year, 
over the course of his life. The track on Sunday was pretty moist, thus most of the field started on intermediate tyres. But as the race went on, the track dried up. McLaren were determined not to make an extra pit stop, and so kept Lewis out on track as his tyres started to melt like Richard Nixon at a presidential podium. Raikkonen, in the meanwhile, wasn't struggling quite as much on his tyres. He kept pestering him lap after lap before eventually sailing by on lap 31. However, it wouldn't matter, because at this point, Hamilton would still be the champion come the end of the race. And so with the lead lost, it was decided by McLaren to yank him into the pit lane to get him off the tyres, put him on fresh ones, and just get this home and drive in the championship. But by this time, those tyres had worn down to the canvas, and what this meant was that the grip was reduced to zero. Coming to rest in the biggest shithousery of a gravel trap ever dreamed up by a racetrack designer, he was beached. He was done. He was out of the Chinese Grand Prix. And it was his mistake that caused it. Not my words. His. And the cruel irony is that because of a rule change brought about by him being hoisted back into the race at the Nürburgring, once he was stuck, he was out. There was no chance of a rescue like before. And this completely turned the championship on its head. Raikkonen had won the race and Alonso wasn't second. This meant that heading into the final round, while Lewis still had the upper hand, Fernando and Kimi were all in with a shot at winning the title. It was an outside chance for the Finn, but it was still a chance. And for Fernando, this could be as simple as finishing two spots ahead of Lewis. Then again, when has anything this year been simple? And so, the Grand Prix Circus congregated at the Interlagos Circuit for the final round, the Brazilian Grand Prix. This amphitheatre of a racetrack serves as the perfect place for the finale, and for Lewis, rather than being nervous, was feeling at ease. His dream of becoming a Formula 1 driver was fulfilled. He had achieved his goal of winning a Formula 1 Grand Prix 2, and what fueled a lot of it was watching his idol, Ayrton Senna, do just that. This was Ayrton's hometown his home racetrack. To Lewis, this was the next best thing to home. And in the years to come, it kind of did become home. He qualified second, ahead of Kimi and Fernando. First job done. Now all that was left was to bring it home on Sunday. He didn't even need to be either of them, but just stay close enough behind, at the very least. Nothing is ever guaranteed in this sport. It's a 17 race calendar, and to win the championship, you must make all of those races count, because you never know when something may go horribly wrong. It was a mid-start for Lewis, and after getting bogged down by the Ferrari ahead, Fernando went on by for third place. Fernando was the one driver that Lewis could not afford to allow to get too far ahead. He kept on his gearbox, and it almost ended in tears. He slid down to eighth place behind the Toyota of Jano Trulli and the BMW Sauber of Nick Heidfeld. Now, he might have been European, but there was no reason to panic. There was still a long way to go in this race. He got back past Trulli. He got back past Heidfeld. And then... Dead. Gone. There was nothing. His gearbox had caught an early flight home and left Lewis to fend for himself. Cars kept screaming by, whilst Lewis was screaming at his dirty, no good, vermin box of gears. Then, after 30 seconds, the car was reanimated after Lewis gave the computer the kiss of life and thus got back into the race. However, at this stage, he had dropped from P6 all the way down to P18. This was a disaster. He probably remembered at that moment that losing this many positions would certainly lose him the championship, with Raikkonen and Alonso up ahead scoring points and all. This scenario left Lewis with only two options. Break down and cry, like I would've, or do what he did, and charge like hell. Car after car after car, he scythed past them all. Switching to a soft tire strategy, he kept moving up through the pack. He eventually broke into the points, but he knew that simply just doing this wasn't going to be enough. Because the Ferraris were wicked fast and Raikkonen was leading the race, Lewis needed to finish ahead of the BMW Salvers. He needed to finish in fifth place, because if it went to a countback, Raikkonen would have been the champion by virtue of having more wins. At the end of lap 71, Raikkonen crossed the line the winner. Alonso finished third and thus left him short of Raikkonen by one point in the standings. With Lewis, his race was run too, and his position was final.
After 17 races, the top three of the championship were all separated by one point. And of all of them, it was Kimi Raikkonen who triumphed and became the 2007 Formula One World Champion. Lewis had missed out by a single point. That is painful. And everyone was left pondering what could have been had the last two rounds gone more smoothly. However, for lack of a better term, that's racing. But whatever way you look at it, despite losing out on the title, this was still a tremendous season. He had achieved so much in his first season statistically and took the fight to his living legend of a teammate who was by absolutely no means a pushover in this season. But with Hamilton, it wasn't purely about the fact that he got pole positions. It's about how he wrangled the most he could out of that car to get it there. It's not purely about the races he won. It's about how he managed the race to get to the checkered flag ahead of everyone else, showing racecraft and maturity beyond his years, beyond his experience, beyond any metric of any expectation set before him, whether they saw him as a prodigy or just this fortunate son who was handed the golden ticket straight out of the gate. And you know, sure, he did walk into one of the best cars on the grid immediately, something that just doesn't happen nowadays, not even to the best of prospects, but he did hold up his end of the bargain and was immediately on the pace. You can't hold that against him with what he had. He knocked it out of the park, ran, caught the ball himself and shoved it up the ass of everyone who doubted him. There's something else too. The mistake mistakes from this year were minimal, especially for a rookie, especially, especially for a rookie in contention for the world championship. I mean, yeah, no big ring and Shanghai happened, but no one is perfect. That's what makes us human. And ultimately, it was learning from those mistakes that made Lewis into the titan that he is today. He had an absolute legend as a teammate and up against a Ferrari contingent that was not being run by Italians and thus good. It's cheap to use stats to prop up Lewis's debut season or any season for that matter, which is why I won't do it. At least not as a be all and end all. Jacques Villeneuve, for example, got his first pole position and race win sooner than Lewis did. But who's the better driver? Really. Conversely, there is no way you can compare Lewis's debut season to Fernando's, because while McLaren was the class of the field in 2007, Minardi were funding their campaign with whatever they found lying underneath the table at a Wendy's. It's impossible to know for sure what was the best rookie season in F1 history. It's all relative after all, but for those of us who remember watching that 2007 season, we remembered watching something truly special. Personally, if I had to choose a greatest rookie season of all time, it's probably this one. Ladies and gentlemen, Lewis Hamilton! After that race, Ron Dennis profusely apologized for his malcontent gearbox, but Lewis merely quipped, yeah, we'll get him next year. I guess that talk of letting a cooler head prevail paid dividends in the end, because like the time where he was on the path to getting his first ever race win, he knew it wasn't a matter of if, it was just a matter of when, and the rest, obviously, was history.